All right. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, worship team. So this morning, we are wrapping up our series on the Beatitudes. And over the last several weeks, uh, we have been talking about uh, Jesus and what he has been, what he preached on the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said in several different areas, he said, he said, poor, blessed are those who, who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they are comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. I think it's fitting that this morning that we're finishing up uh, this series uh, of the Beatitudes, talking about Matthew 5.10, because I think that's exactly where our students are today and what they're dealing with on a regular basis. And uh, Jesus says in Matthew 5.10, it says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Guys, that is what our youth is dealing with today. Those who are believers in Jesus Christ, uh, they, have, they walk onto the battlefield every day going into school. And I believe that's what Jesus is talking about here. And I want you to put yourself back in, um, in the age of our students. Some of you, that may be a further journey than others. <laughs> but I truly want you to think about being the age of 12 13, 14, 15 years old. I want you to put yourself back there. And if you were a Christ follower, if you believed in Jesus back then, how were you treated? Were you treated as, were you mocked? Were you lied about? Were evil things said about you as a Christ follower? I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, we would say yes. We would say that we were on the battlefield and we were, we were on the front lines and we dealt with that on a regular basis. And in fact, I believe that we can also say, say that um, as the, the age that we are currently, that we all are on the front lines. We all are dealing with this. Now, I want you to think about how much harder it is for our students today because of one, one atmosphere, one, one phrase, and that is social media. I want you to think about that for a second, because conversations are literally at your fingertips. Comments are literally at their fingertips. And the thing is, guys, is we can look at this and we can say, okay, there are videos out there of our students being mocked of, being lied about, evil things being said about them. This is stuff that happens on a daily basis of our students, and it's all out for the world to see. They are literally on the battlefront. They're on the battle lines uh, of today, and they're dealing with it day after day after day. They're being persecuted for being Christ followers, but in an instant. Because back whenever you and I were, uh, were younger, we could say things at school. We could be a Christ follower um, outside of school, and it didn't matter because we always knew that we had a safe space when we went home, Right? We always knew that whenever we went home, we could, we could be comforted by our parents. And there was no repercussion of what we said. That's not the case in today's society because now this is always on social media. If our students are said, if our students say something and they're recorded, that is out there for the world to see. And they're constantly being mocked by that. Guys, our students are on the battlefield. And they're dealing with this as Christ followers. I love what Luke says in six, uh, Luke 6.22, because he says, Blessed are you who are hated because of my name. When they exclude you, when they insult you, when they reject you for the evil things that has been done to them, just because they are sons and daughters of me. So my question for you this morning, this morning is, how is the world treating you and our students as Christ followers? And are we as adults protecting our students? I'm putting this on you and I'm putting this on myself as I believe that, that we have one job to do. We have one job to do and that is protect our children. They are dealing with this on a daily basis. They're being persecuted. They're being mocked. They're being lied about. But for us as adults, we're here to protect our children. 
My goal every year for Youth Takeover is to, to allow you to see your students the way that I see them, to see them with potential, to see them with the passion of Christ, to see them as they desire to serve our church and our communities. But I believe it also so many times that the church, you and I, we're the ones that are mocking them. We're the ones that are persecuting them. We're the ones that say evil things about the next generation. We look down on them for, for what they're doing, and we think that they're not capable of doing what we can do. At some points, yes, you are right, but other points, they far surpass what you and I can do. But we don't give them an opportunity. My challenge to you, church, is to be different. My challenge to you is to bless the generations that are coming behind us, to be able to look at them differently as they're up here on the stage, as they're worshiping, as they're giving the messages, to be able to look at them as young Christ followers. I believe that's how we're supposed to see them. Look at them as Christ followers just in a smaller package, sometimes in a bigger package because they're taller than I am. Doesn't take much. I believe that that is where, how we need to look at them. So that's my challenge to you this morning. I want you to find Jesus in our students. And listen, I want to challenge you with something. By I want to tell you, I want you to find Jesus not only in the spiritual sense, but also in the literal sense. Because every one of our students is carrying a little Jesus. I think we have a picture up here. Right here. This is what it looks like. It's a little Jesus. So the reason why I tell you this is because I want you to go and I want you to talk to our students. And I want you to find out why do they believe in Jesus Christ? Why are they a Christ follower? And what's going to happen is these students are going to take their little Jesus and they're going to give it to you. And what I want you to do is I want you to take this little Jesus, put it someplace where you can remember the student that gave it to you, and I want you to pray for that student. Because once again, they're being mocked. They're being persecuted. They're being lied about. They're on the front lines of being a Christ follower. And I believe once again, as you and I, we are challenged to stand in the gap and to help them. And so that's my goal for you this morning. That's my challenge is that you will go up and talk to one of our students. Every one of them has a little Jesus and ask them about it and allow them to share their Jesus with you. I'm really excited to have Candace Martin come to the stage as she comes and she gives the next part of the message. doesn't care about you? Well, trust me, I've been there myself. So in December of 2022, I decided to go to the winter retreat at Camp Eligua. I ended up getting very sick, one of the worst colds I've ever had. The symptoms were congestion, sneezing, coughing, and we decided to still go on a Christmas trip to go see my grandparents who lived in Connecticut. Because um, my dad ended up getting a lot sicker than I did, and it weakened him so much to the point where he had a heart attack. Not only did he have a heart attack, but he had a heart attack while trying to drive us home. So he quickly turned around and dropped my sister and I, who was six at the time, and myself back at my grandparents. And a few hours later, I got the call that my dad had a heart attack. A huge pile of guilt fell on my heart because I felt like I gave him the heart attack because I gave him my sickness. So because my dad was sick when he went into the hospital, you can't have surgery when you're sick, so you need to wait until you're better. So he spent about two and a half weeks in the hospital waiting to get better. And due to hospital guidelines, my sister and I couldn't see him. The only day that I could see him with exception was on my 15th birthday. And his birthday was the next day, and that was two days before his surgery. There was a very high success rate in his surgery, quadruple bypass surgery. But the few percent that weren't high scared me. Having the fear of your parent or loved one possibly dying is the worst fear, in my opinion. This is where my mental health started to take a turn. Not only was the trauma from my dad's heart attack, but unresolved trauma from earlier in my life started to appear. My dad's surgery was successful, and a few days later we were back home in Pennsylvania after nearly a month long of trauma. 
January is hard with my mental health because it was winter and my dad's heart attack and still unresolved trauma. In February, I began to feel like no one loved or cared about me. Every day I would wake up feeling like if I died, no one would care. No one would ever think about me again. And that included God. On February 21st, I got admitted into the ER, ER for suicidal ideation. I remember sitting on the couch with my mom before I went to the ER about how I felt about myself and my mental health. I still remember my mom's scared look on her face as she heard that her daughter didn't want to live anymore. I stayed in the ER for about two days, waiting for a bed to open in a mental health, health, behavioral health hospital. In the meantime, people from a recovery program called Regen came to help uplift my spirits. I remember someone telling me, you should be grateful to be alive. God wants you alive. But I remember getting so angry at those words because why would God let me think these things about myself and go through these things if he wanted me alive? I spent about two weeks in the behavioral health hospital, and the whole time I was there, I was thinking to myself, how does God love me? How does he let his sons and daughters go through these things? I look back on my life, and I feel so sad for my old self, but I can't look back on the past. I can only move forwards in my life. If only I knew how good God's grace was and how much he truly did care and love for me. Some of the ways God has shown his love through me is through giving me comfort in hard times, him holding my hand and giving me that comfort that he's never going to leave me again. And now I know that he is never going to leave me. No matter how hard my life gets, he'll never leave me. And now I can say, oh, sorry, I left my pot. Um, and also another way is through how I think about people. Whenever I'm arguing with someone or have an altercation with them, I don't necessarily get angry and hold grudges for a long time. Yes, I'm angry in the beginning, but I end up praying for them. No matter who you are, if we have ever had an altercation or argument, I'm praying for you. So, a couple ways that my life has changed in a year span, which I am so grateful for, is that I am now on the worship team. I get to praise God every day. And one, praising is also one of the ways that I express myself to God. It's one of the ways that I talk to him. I got baptized on the spring retreat. And no, yeah, sorry. Also something that has helped me a lot is reading my Bible. I understand that reading your Bible is hard, and I get that. But not only does the Bible show me how to live in my Christianity, but it gives me comfort. Whenever I'm angry... And my mom. Um, <laughs> I go and read my Bible. Like, we were camping, and I was like, I need to go read my Bible. I'll be right back. <laughs> and a lot of people have the Bible app on their phones. Meanwhile, that is good, but I feel like that's a big distraction. Because if you're reading the Bible and you get a notification from Facebook, you're like, ooh, who posted? So... I would recommend getting a hardcover of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, I'm sure the church would love to give you a free one. Youth group has helped me overcome my trauma and come extremely closer with God. Youth group is the reason why I am the Christian I am today. Youth group has also helped me make friends that I never thought I'd have. Friends who are there for me. Friends who care for me. Friends who are there for me whenever I need them. Youth group leaders who have heard me cry, have hugged me, telling me everything is okay. I look forward to the messages every week and hanging out with my friends. If you were in the room today and you felt the way I have, I want to tell you it's okay and you're not alone. I promise. If you're ever, if you are going through depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, anger problems, or substance abuse, I'd like to recommend Regeneration. This is a 12-step biblical program. And if you're interested, please see me or Doug Coldsmith out by the um, summer circles, and we will give you further information. I have seen life change in this program. I have seen people overcome things they never thought they would overcome. I recommend you to try it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone in this room today. I thank you for everyone who has come to church today for youth takeover. I thank you for the youth takeover. I pray for anyone who has ever felt the way I have. And if you are feeling like this today, I pray that you would give them comfort and put your hand on them. Jesus, I thank you so much. And we pray, amen. Can I please welcome to the stage Carter Eckenrod?
Good morning, church. Oh, come on. There's so many more of you. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's a little better. First service was just not awake. And I totally understand that. I was not awake either. I was up here. I was thinking of pulling up a uh, chair and taking a quick nap. So those of you who don't know me, my name is Carter Reckonroad. I attend Shippensburg for school. I do soccer and swim and dive there. But I come up here for youth group and for church. I play guitar on both the worship teams for the main service and for the youth service. And we're going to come back to guitar in a little bit. But those of you that know me know how stubborn I am. I might be the most stubborn person. Mom, Dad, I'm sure you can attest. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you, Mimi and Pappy. Yeah. <laughs> I am so stubborn. If I want to do something, it's done. I- I'm doing it. I don't, I don't care what anyone says. I- I'm doing it. But if I don't want to do something, it's not getting done. And uh, there's some good parts to that. I'm still trying to figure out what those are. But eventually, I'll figure out why my stubbornness is good. I'll, I'll find a way to use that. And actually, one way that I used to be stubborn that you probably wouldn't expect was with guitar. I was so stubborn with guitar. My dad would sit me down. He'd be like, hey, you, you want to learn guitar? I'd be like, yeah, I, I want to learn guitar. And then I'd get bored, and I'd walk away. Because it just wasn't something that I wanted to do. So I just would walk away from it. I wanted to pick up the guitar and automatically know what I was doing. My dad tried three times to get me to play before he eventually was like, okay, if he wants to learn, he's going to have to learn on his own because he just wasn't going to be able to teach me. I wanted to learn how to play, but I didn't want to have to put in the work for it. I just wanted to pick it up and know every single chord, know how to strum, know the progressions. But it wasn't that easy. So whenever it wasn't that easy, I gave up. I just put it back down. I grew up with great bands, like the Eagles. My pap introduced me to the Eagles growing up, and I had a great role model listening to Next to Nothing. That that was like my band growing up, Next to Nothing. Those of you who don't know what that is, that is my dad and Chris Kluke's band, old band, and I went to every single one of the shows that I could, so I did actually grow up with that. I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be able to just play the guitar and be able to understand how to do the things and be able to use that for something good like they were doing. And I think sometimes we get that way with God. Like, I just want to pick up this Bible and know how to do everything. I don't want to have to put in the work to do it, but I want to be able to just pick up the Bible and be able to perform the same miracles that God did, have that relationship with God, but I don't want to have to go through the hard times with him. I don't want to have to stay consistent with him. Whenever I would pick up the guitar as a kid, I never learned anything because I didn't stay consistent. There was never a time where I picked it up and I never put it back down. It was always, okay, yeah, I'll pick it up for a week, and I'm going to set it back down. And how often do we get that way with God? We're like, God, I'm on fire for you. I want to read your word every single day. I want to be with you. I want to talk to you. And that only lasts for a week, so I set it back down. Just like whenever I was a kid, I got that way with God. And I think a lot of us can relate to that. Consistency is key. If we stay connected to God, we will be able to grow and we'll be able to learn. At one of the youth retreats, they brought up the verse, John 15, 4. So if you want to turn there with me. It says, remain in me and I will remain in you. For the branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, I will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That verse really says that we're able to do nothing apart from God. We have to learn to stay connected to God. And one of the ways that we can do that is through his word. This is, this is God. The word is God. If we stay consistent in reading our Bibles and praying, we're able to grow. We're able to produce the fruit that's meant to be produced. So about two years ago then, I picked the guitar up on my own. I, my parents were at work, and I went upstairs, and I found an old guitar in the attic. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll I'll try it. So I picked it up, and I was like, well, I still don't know how to do it right. I got frustrated. I was like, I'm not going to keep trying. But then I took it downstairs with me. I was like, okay, I'll try to learn some chords. And so I learned my first chord, and after that, it was over. I never looked back. I wanted to play every single day that I could. I wanted to learn new chords. I wanted to learn new ways to strum. I wanted to learn time. Actually, the timing thing didn't really happen. I kind of avoid that. I come in whenever I want to, really. (laughs) I wanted to be a better guitar player. I wanted to be able to use that ability for God. And what if we got that way with God? 
What if we picked up the Bible and we're like, I want to learn every single day. There's nothing I want to do but learn this. I want to learn how I can produce fruit. I want to be like God. I want to be a mirrored version of God. I want to walk the life that Jesus had for us. Then life starts to get a little bit easier. And once we get onto that spark, onto that passion, there's always going to be something that's going to try and take your attention away. Those of you that go up to Camp Yelidua or have ever been up to Camp Yelidua, we talk about a mountaintop experience. We're at the peak, peak level of our faith. We're surrounded by Christians. We're worshiping. We're doing devotions. We're reading the Bible every single day. We're we're like that for an entire week up at Camp Yelidua. We're like, man, there is nothing that's going to bring me down. And then we have to come back down off the mountain. We have to face the real world again. And then things slowly start to creep into our life. Ah, man, I got to go back to school. Okay, I'll go to school. I'll make time for you later, God. Oh man, I, video games are back in my life. I, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go do that. I'll talk to you later, God. And we don't have our phones up at camp, so we're like, "Oh, hey, I'm on my phone again. I, I'll, I'll make time for you. Don't worry. I, I, I'm free next Tuesday. Are you free? Oh, wait, never mind. I, I'm not free next Tuesday. How about next month? That's how we get with God. So we have to learn to cut off the distractions. Do not disturb has been one of the biggest things to ever happen to my phone. I use that for school and work just that way. I'm not constantly getting a buzz in my back pocket and thinking, oh, I, I wonder what that was. But what if I use that for God? What if I did that when I picked up my Bible? We all have these abilities to do these things, but a lot of times we just don't do it. So that's, that's it. We, we just turn on our phone and do not disturb. It's easy. That's fixed, right? Well, we still have school and work. We can't really avoid those. I tried avoiding school for years and years and years. <laughs> still not working. My mom says I have uh, senioritis already, which I'm a junior, so I'm in trouble. I'm in real trouble. <laughs> so if we can't cut off these distractions, how are we supposed to focus on God? It's by inviting God into those areas. We are not supposed to live a life that has our lives and God separate. Once we accept Christ, we're supposed to invite them into both. Once God is in our daily lives, school and work, we get to see the way he's moving. We get to show, be an example for him. It's not always going to be easy. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to go through hard times. And my life first has become 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, if you want to turn there with me. It says, so be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead. Even though you may endure all kinds of trials for a little while, these trials will show that your faith is genuine and is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Through your faith, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring much praise and glory and honor on the day that Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. I always thought, God, why are you taking us through these hard times? Why do we face these difficult moments? Like, I accepted you. I'm trying to put in the work for you. But yeah, we still have to go through all these hard times. And this verse clearly says that it's because we are tested. Our goal, our faith is being tested. So that way, one day, we don't have to go through those tests anymore. And in some versions, it's, it uses the word tribulations. And then that word confused me. It's a big word. So I did a definition search, and it said, being in a state of great trouble or suffering. It doesn't say, God doesn't say, oh yeah, you're going to go through some bad times, some not so great times. He says, you're going to go through great suffering because of me. But don't worry, this is because you're being tested, your faith is being tested, so that way whenever I return, your glory can be seen. God never promises us an easy life. He never says, as soon as you accept me, life's going to get easier. He just promises to walk with us through those hard times. So how do we stay consistent through the hard times? The Bible. It is the foundation that we must stand on. Once this becomes our foundation, our lives look a whole lot different. And it's not easy. It's very much so not easy to stay in it. And it can't be someone else's passion. I can't stand here and make you have that passion for Christ. Just like my dad couldn't make me have the passion for guitar. You have to find your own spark and find your own love for Christ. No one can force that on you. Just like I didn't give up whenever it was hard to learn guitar. I bled 
plenty of times. I opened up my, I ripped open my skin, but now I'm able to use that for the glory of God. Your faith is not always going to be easy. You're going to go through times where it's really hard, really hard to stay faithful with him. But consistency is key with that. So here's my challenge for you. Find one way this week that you were able to limit your distractions. And if you're not able to limit those distractions, invite God into those moments. Turn your phone on Do Not Disturb whenever you're trying to do a devotion. Talk to the people who work about God. Find a way that you can make a difference. Let's pray. DJ, thank you for this day you give us here. God, I just thank you for everything this youth is able to do. And God, I just pray that as we grow up through this week, God, that you just allow us to find ways to limit the distractions. And God, I just pray that our passion would be towards you. And God, I pray that we'd be able to focus on you. God, I just thank you for the youth here. God, I just pray that you would allow us just to be able to grow. And God, just be able to make a difference for you. And God, I just pray that this, your spirit would fall upon this room. And God, that everybody would be able to walk out of here. And God, just be able to see the ways that you're moving. In your name pray. Amen. Good morning. Yes, my mic is on this time. I'm so excited to get to ask these students a couple of questions about their faith. So as we get into it, would you guys just share your name and what one word you would use to describe yourself? Uh, I'm Caden, and Lee told me to say impulsive. So that's what I'm going to say. I'm Ava, and I would describe myself as determined. I'm Manuela, and I'm Brazilian. Let's go. (laughs) So what is, it, uh, what is your favorite part of being in the Point Youth Group? The people are great. I like being involved with things. Like, and I love talking to people. So that's. Yeah, I love the community. They've drawn me so close to the Lord. And I also love the worship. We have a great worship team. Yeah, I love the way we support each other. And we have worship like... Awesome. So how has God recently answered one of your prayers? Um, so when I moved, I was really scared that I had nobody. I didn't, I, my English wasn't very well, so terrible, but hey. And I was afraid that I was lacking that sense of belonging. And I say, God, I need a community. I need to find a church. I need friends again. And then God was like, the point youth ministry. Yeah, I've been um, praying a lot for just more ways to um, just share the love of Christ with everybody. And Youth Takeover has been a way he answered my prayers, just to be able to share with everybody here and um, just how much I love the Lord and how much he loves everybody here. Uh, a few years ago, I was really depressed, and I was just praying to God that he would give me like someone or something that I could get involved in and who I could talk to. And uh, I joined the Point Youth Ministry, and I got Lee Thank you, Lee. Let's go. What Bible verse means most to you and why? Uh, For me, uh, this is one that my mom loves to tell me to do. So it's Philippians 2, 14 and 15. And it says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Yeah, you still got work to do. <laughs> yeah, I know. Such a wise I try. <laughs> I try. Uh, my favorite verse is Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. Um, ever since I was a kid in Bible memory, that verse has stuck with me. And it's just, it just means to me, like, anything I'm going to do, it has to come from God's strength. Not my own, because humans are like dumb sheep. We're going to fall off the cliff. <laughs> um, one I really like is Psalm 34, eight that says... Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him? Because I can say my walk with Christ really started when God became my God and not my parents' God. And that's what made me grow as a person and as a Christian. Awesome answers. So why did each of you make the decision to go all in for Jesus and be a Christ follower? So... It all started when I went to camp when I was really little. Um, 
Uh, I went up to Yalidrua for the first time. I didn't know anybody. I didn't really know what it meant to be a Christ follower because I was really young. All I knew was, yeah, worship, Jesus. But I didn't really understand all of that. So I went to camp and I got involved with a lot of people that really showed me the how to follow Jesus. And I, I never looked back. Yeah, I was uh, raised by some amazing Christian parents, and uh, they brought me here to Grand Point when I was like, I don't know, two months old, so it's been a while here, and then um, sent me to Camp Elijah as well, and that um, being there really jump-started my relationship with the Lord, so after that, yeah, that was it. I mean, I'm on fire for Him, and it's, yeah. It's hard to say a specific moment when that happens, but I would say mainly it was my parents, because I would always see the way they talk with their church friends, the way they would pray for us, the way they, they would cry and sing and dance and worship. And I look at them and say, that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to have what they have in that thing with Jesus. What things, what things do you do to grow in your relationship with Jesus as a young person? Read the Bible. Uh, yeah, to elaborate on that, something I like to do is I'll make sure that that's like the first thing I do just to start my day off um, with God, having my quiet time with him. That's just a little thing I do. I have to remember it's not about how I feel because one day I was having my teenage drama and then my mom looks at me and say, I don't care how you feel, get up and do your stuff. <laughs> and so that's with God. God doesn't care how we feel, we just know it. And so we need to do what we know it's best for us. Read your Bible, as Kate and say Prime mom advice right there. <laughs> awesome. So the last question that I'm going to ask you guys is, have you ever doubted your faith? And how might you encourage someone else who is doubting their faith right now? Uh, I think I have doubted my faith a lot. And I can't speak for everybody, but I think a lot of people in this room right now have doubted their faith. Maybe even people up on the stage. Um, and it's difficult to not because I feel like me as a person I want to find the facts and I'm and I have a really hard time relying on the faith so when you try and find facts and faith in the faith it doesn't always go hand in hand and it takes a lot to just completely rely on the faith I think doubt kind of comes with a package when you choose faith because um, that's exactly what faith is it's trusting in God even when you can't find the facts when you are doubting that it's all real so to have faith like that kind of comes with it is doubting I remember one day when I was having a sleepover and I had way too much sugar and I'm like is God even real and if hell is not real and we all die and disappear and then my mom told me I love my mom and she's like you need to remember the things that you've seen, the things that you know, the things that other people told you, because having that support system and having the memory of what happened in the past is what makes us certain of what's happening now and that can move us forward. Awesome, thank you guys so much for being up here. Thanks thank for having you. us.